Uh, so as we continue on the uh, history of the tabernacle, actually what I would like to do is, you know, for this handout on the tabernacle, I found this, and this is, and I put his name on there, I can't say his last name, but Vern, and I really was impacted by what he said, so if you don't mind, you can read that real quick before I start. <clears throat> And it's, uh, the tabernacle is a symbol of God's dwelling. Did you jump in It's, uh, what it says, um, what did Israelites see when they looked at the tabernacle so long ago? They saw a tent with two inner rooms and a yard outside. In the yard was the Israelite equivalent of a stove, namely a place where meat could be roasted on a fire. A tent means very little to us. But the Israelites knew all about tents because they were living in tents themselves. Then God told them to make a tent for himself, a tent where God himself would dwell and meet with him. His tent had rooms and a yard and a fireplace like their own. Yet it was also unlike their own. It was majestic, covered with gold and blue. It was beautiful because of the symmetry of its dimensions and the artistry of its constructions. Do you see? God was saying that he was majestic and beautiful. But we would not simply remain in heaven and let Israel go its way. He would come right down among them. They were living in tents. He would be in a tent side by side with their own tents. They were going to the promised land. He too would travel to the promised land as his tent was packed up by the Levites and moved to the next encampment. The special cloud of fire symbolizing God's presence was a more intensive, miraculous form of the same reality. God would be among them, right with them, Emmanuel. A bright cloud of glory symbolizing God's presence accompanied the Israelites and came over the tabernacle after it was constructed. The theme that God dwells with his people was fulfilled with the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, the tabernacle foreshadowed the fact that Christ would become incarnate and dwell among us. The word became flesh and lived for a while, tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Christ's glory superseded the bright cloud of glory, and now Christ sends his Holy Spirit like a cloud of fire to make his church and his people into a tabernacle of God. The tabernacle expresses another side of the to the character of God, namely that he is holy and, in and inaccessible. The altar, several coverings, and two sets of curtains bar the way into his presence. No one can enter into the inner room, the most holy place, except the high priest. And even then, only once a year in a special ceremony, where he is protected from his sin and the accusation of the law by the blood that he brings in and sprinkles on the mercy seat. Death is threatened to the transgressor of God's holiness. Even the priests may suffer death if they do not honor God. They are especially in danger of death as they approach the inner rooms of the tabernacle. The high priest must take special care, not even to see the atonement cover when he performs his actions in the most holy place. By these means, the Lord shows the preciousness of the love between the Father and the Son. The tabernacle's symbolism points to Christ. Defilement of this symbolism constitutes an attack on Christ and so arouses God's indignation in intense form. The same truths also embody a lesson concerning Christ's sacrificial death. God's holiness is so great that faults against him deserve death. Christ himself was perfect, holy, perfectly holy. But when he bore our sins and became sin for us, the Father had to put him to death. To this death he consented willingly and went like a sheep to slaughter because of his love for us and his hatred of sin's rule over us. Christ had to die. There was no other way by which we might enter into the true tabernacle in heaven and enjoy the blessings of God's presence forever. But now because Christ has died, the animal sacrifices are ended 
and we have access to God with freedom. The veil barring the way to God's presence is taken away, or rather fulfilled in the body of Christ. Christ does not bar us out as the veil did, but provides the way in. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. The veil has become the gate into the security of the sheepfold. For those outside of Christ, the death penalty for violations of God's holiness says something else. When Christ returns to judge the world, God's holiness will appear in intense form. Just as at Mount Sinai, the mount was covered with the glory of God's holiness, so at the second coming, the world as a whole will be covered with his glory. The wicked must experience eternal death because they are violators of the holiness of Christ. God's love for Christ also implies his hatred for Christ's enemies and his zeal to vindicate Christ's honor. Those who honor me, I will honor, is true also at the last day. When Christ receives the full honor due to him, all rebellion is utterly crushed. I thought that was her. <laughs> when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, it was such a holy place that they tied a rope to the ankle of the high priest so if God struck him dead, they could pull him out. Because they couldn't go in there and get him. Thank God for grace. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank God for grace, I'm telling you. All right, we're going to be talking tonight about the courtyard, and hopefully we can get into actually the oil for the lamp, but uh, we've got quite a bit to cover for the courtyard. Uh, in this illustration, uh, what it shows is, what it shows is that the outer court or the outer curtain of the tabernacle is 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. This is the uh, north, the south, the west, and the east. And the east, of course, was the entrance into the tabernacle the way it is even now to this day in Jerusalem. There's an eastern gate that will take you into the temple area. But it's 150 feet by 75 feet. And we're going to kind of break that down a little bit as we go along. All right, let's start with Exodus 27. And it will be in verse 9 that we will begin. This is the Lord's command. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side, the court shall have hangings. <clears throat> of fine twine linen, a hundred cubits long for one side. Its twenty pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise, for its length on the north side, there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long. Its pillars twenty and their bases twenty of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillet shall be of silver. And for the breadth of the court, on the west side, there shall be hangings for 50 cubits with 10 pillars on each and 10 bases. Now, once again, remember, the cubits come out to the north and the south is 150 feet. The west and the east is 75 feet. All right. Continuing on in verse 13. On the east end, toward the sunrise, the courtyard also has uh, 50 is 50 cubits wide. Curtains 15 cubits long are to be on one side of the entrance, with three posts and three bases. And curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side, with three posts and three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of purple, blue, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. The work of an embroiderer with four posts and four bases. So basically the way it is on the front, on the east side, is there were two curtains on both sides that were white, and they were 22 and a half feet long. And then in the middle, 
the actual entrance curtains that was 30 feet uh, long. All right, continuing on. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. The courtyard shall be, once again, the Lord says it again, 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, which is 150 by 75, with curtains of finely twisted linen, five cubits high. Five cubits high comes out to seven and a half, seven and a half feet high, tall. And with bronze bases. All other articles used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it, and those for the courtyard, are to be of bronze. Now you know that the Lord is so specific about the types of material that is to be used for what purpose. Uh, remember, the, the uh, bases of each one of those pillars is made of bronze, and then, of course, you know, you've got all the different, we've got silver, we have bronze, all of these different things that are going on in the uh, outer court. All right, so let's summarize it a little bit, make it easier what we just read. <coughs> the curtains will stretch for 150 feet on the south side and the north side of the court. They would make 20 pillars made of bronze. 20 sockets also made of bronze. Curtains will be held up with silver hooks attached to silver rods attached to the posts. Number two, curtains on the west end will be 75 feet long with 10 pillars set into 10 bases. And then number three, on the east side, east end will also be 75 feet long courtyard entrance will be on the east side flanked by two curtains. We'll have a picture in a minute. Curtain on the left and on the right side, as I said earlier, will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. For the entrance into the courtyard, make a curtain that is 30 feet long. Fashion it from fine linen and decorate it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet thread. And then it would be attached to four posts that fit into four bases. So the linen that's the 22 and a half feet on both sides of the entrance curtain had to have three posts. Then the entrance into the, uh, into the tabernacle had to have four posts. All the posts around the courtyard must be connected by silver rods using silver hooks. The posts are to be set in solid bronze bases. God was extremely specific. And that's what we want to break down. We've, we've looked at it before, but we want to look at it again. What was the purpose of bronze? What was the meaning of silver? So, as we continue on, so the entire courtyard, once again, I'm really making sure we get it, 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, with curtain walls, seven and a half feet high, all of that was made with fine linen. So you can imagine what, how much time that took to make uh, fine linen on every one of those all the way around. And this is what I was telling you about these four that is the entrance into the outer court. But they were uh, embroidered with the colors and fine linen, you know, uh, intertwined and so forth. They were definitely set apart. And then you had the three posts here, the three posts here, and then of course the four uh, for them. Do you think all those materials were given to them by the Egyptians? I think some of it could, but remember they had sheep too to get the wool yeah. and things like that to make threads. They had um, a lot of things that they had required from the Egyptians the to gold, make that. Silver, bronze, probably all the, the Egyptians. I would definitely the gold. They had a lot of gold inside. Right. So. I wanted to really focus on the 150 by 75 because it's like the Lord made specific reference to it. Now, 
Can you imagine in Hebrew, if I was to say like, okay, I have $150 or whatever, the word for $150 is meyakamishim. That's a lot for just to say $150. Meyakamishim. And then meyakamishim means $150. Next to it are all the Hebrew letters that make up meyakamishim. Starts with the Hebrew letter Mem, which means mighty and massive. And then you have Aleph, strength, God first. Then you have He, which is to behold, to reveal. Then you have He, to say it right. Is it He? Fence, protect, separate. Mem again, but this also means to come from like water. Yo. Finished work, hand, shin, devour, something sharp. It also uh, contains the name El Shaddai, which is another name for God. Yod again, hand, deep done, and then Samech, which is to support, to assist. All of those Hebrew letters make up and become Meachamishim, which means 150. So, it's like, Lord, what are you saying? That you wanted it to be 150 feet long. Well, we can look at the Hebrew words and the Hebrew, I mean, the Hebrew letters and the meaning of each one. We can begin to look at what it's saying. We all know God has his name for sure in that, in that tabernacle, in that curtain, because it's mentioned in the, in the letter Aleph, and it's mentioned in the uh, letter Shem, El Shaddai, God. All right, God being mighty and massive, strong, head to behold, to reveal. God was going to behold and reveal his mighty, massive self in this tabernacle because he was going to come down in his glory cloud, in his Shekinah glory. And if you remember as we studied weeks past, why did he even want them to build this tabernacle? He wanted them to assemble it because he wanted to be among them. And just like the article that we read earlier is so true, they all were living in tents and God wanted to dwell among them. So he had the Israelites build a tent for him to dwell in. So it was for him. Yes, they benefited from it, but God wanted to be among his people. So he had them build a tent. And through that, as we're already beginning to see in these weeks past, he's revealing himself. Okay, so even it, him wanting it 150 feet long, you can see that his hand is on it, the finish done, deep done to it. He's there to support and assist. He's also to come to them just like water would come to a stream. His glory would come down and be among them. They could see his glory cloud. They knew that God was there. It was also, as, as Heth says, to fence, protect, and separate. Also, the thing about it is, even though he came down to dwell among them, there still was a separation. Because they were not walking in the pure holiness of God. And that's why only the high priest could go into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, once a year, as Pastor Key said, with a rope tied around his ankle. Because if he did not prepare himself, wash himself, clean himself, purify himself, all those <coughs> things, and even dared to step behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, he would die just like that. And they would have to pull him out by the rope. And obviously it happened before. <laughs> of course, it obviously is. It happened before already, so. So if I want to read that, so the mem is the first letter on the right? It's right to left, right? Yes, right to left. Okay. Yes. Yep. 
Do you have like a sheet or something that has all the letters? Sure we actually do. Okay. I actually, we actually do. Uh, Daryl and Elizabeth have made copies and stuff, and we hand them out at the, the Hebrew Sunday School class on Sunday morning, but we do have some extra copies. Okay. Yes, and have what all the meanings are of the letters. Just remind us. Yeah. All right, so this is all what 150 means in Hebrew. Anybody, can y'all say the Hebrew name for 150? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, before you know it, y'all going to be tour guides in Israel. All right. Now, this is how you say, uh-huh. Each, each great has a numeric value. Does that add up to 150? I tried to add it up, but no, it goes way up. It was like 700 or something. You know? And I was really, I was like, Lord, is there any? But that's a good, very good, good question. question point. Yeah. It is, because sometimes it does. All right, so now 75 feet wide, right? So it's like, Lord, why 75? Now, this is how you would say 75 in Hebrew. Shavim ben kamesh. They say it a lot faster than that. Shavim ben kamesh. All right. That's how you would say 75. If somebody says, well, I want $75 for it, they're going to say that word. Okay? There are the Hebrew letters for Shavim Ben Kamesh. It is starting with, as, as like uh, Zach pointed out, it is, it's right to left. So the first uh, Hebrew letter is Shin. Once again, what does Shin mean? Devour, consume, El Shaddai. Now, that's not the only three meanings for Shin. There's others as well. But you've got to go with where the Lord's leading you on. Uh, there could be two or three other ones as well too. But God's kind of leading uh, on which one he wants to specify. All right. Shin means devour, consume, El Shaddai. Bet, also you can say vet, means house and tent. And the reason why this can be interchangeable because it can stand for the letter B, it can stand for the letter V, and you can see V is right up in here. Shin would be right here, and then you've got the V. All right, so it means house and tent. Then Ain means I to see. Yod, once again, finished work, the hand. Uh, Samech means to support, to assist. Noon, which is just, um, this is the noon soffit, which indicates it's the end of a word because it's two words to make up 75. He, fence, separate, protect. Mem, mighty, massive. Shin, something sharp. El Shaddai. So what are we saying? What is God showing us in the fact that he wanted it to be 75 feet wide? Once again, his name's in there, El Shaddai. It's his tent. Eyes to see his finished work. He's there to support, to assist, but also to separate, to protect a fence. Mighty, massive El Shaddai. Now, With the 75 fit width, not only was on the west end, which was what we would call where uh, the sun would rise, but on the east end. That is the entrance into the tabernacle. And that's extremely important as we go along why the east side of the courtyard uh, is so important. Now, remember when we read earlier that he said on the 150, he wanted 20 pillars. Why do you want 20, Lord? Why not 15? Why not 25? He wanted 20. So in Hebrew, 20, the word is Ezrem. And there are the Hebrew letters for Ezrem, meaning 20. First letter, I, I to see, to be seen and understand. Shin, again, devour, consume, El Shaddai. Resh, the highest, most important. Yod, the finished work, hand. Mem, 
means mighty and massive. Once again, remember, there were 20 pillars for the north and the south side. So here you have 150 um, feet, and the curtains are held up by 20 pillars. Why is that? Once again, God's name is in it. El Shaddai, 20. Eyes to see, to be seen, so that the, the children of Israel can understand that he is the highest, most important person. And he's going to finish the work with his hand because he is mighty and massive and powerful. And those 20 pillars, as God being his name in that, that he is mighty and massive, he is the highest, most important their eyes will see the strength even in those 20 pillars holding up that curtain. He also then, 10 pillars for the west side of the courtyard, the back side of it. Why did you want 10, Lord, to hold up 75 feet? 10, the Hebrew word is Eser. Eser. The Hebrew letters for Eser is the first one is I, which is another I to see. You'll notice as he's going around each um, side of the tabernacle, the courtyard, it's always got eyes to see because he wanted to be among his people. His name is in the number 10 as well too. Devour, consume, El Shaddai, being the highest, most important person. So the, the tribes that would camp behind the tabernacle on the west side, they could see God's glory. They could see the highest, most important person that dwells in that tabernacle. The same way with the north and the south because God's name in there, eyes to see that the highest, most important person his, his glory dwells in that tabernacle. And, of course, the curtain, 75 feet long, is being held up by those ten pillars. Now, now we go to three. Why three? Because as we were reading earlier, we're talking about the east side now, which is the entrance into the courtyard. There were three posts on this side, three posts on this side, and then there were four that held up the actual curtain that let, let them go into the entrance into the outer court. So why three, Lord? Why three? Because remember, this side had 22 and a half feet. This side had 22 and a half feet. So three pillars <coughs> held up 22 and a half feet on either side. So... The number three in Hebrew is Shlosha. And there's the Hebrew letters. Shem, Devar, Consume, El Shaddai. His name is in this, his name is even in number three. Lamed, teach, rod, to urge forward. Remember now, keep in mind that this is on the east side of the courtyard, which is the entrance. So it being three pillars, God's basically saying, you know, with his name there, I want to teach you. I want you to urge forward into the outer court and those that were allowed to go into the actual inner court. Shin is another um, Hebrew letter into in the word shlosha, shlosha. And it also, in this case, means point of a rock, sharp. Well, we all know Jesus is also called the rock, right? Well, the entrance into the tabernacle has Jesus written all over it. Hey, behold to reveal. Okay? From the north, from the, from the south, from the west, there's a curtain where they could not see in. But on the east that had the three posts and then the four posts and so forth, the three, when you see what the Hebrew uh, word means and the letters, 
God is saying that in the entrance into the courtyard where in the temple or the tabernacle where he dwells, his name's in it. He wants to urge people forward. He wants to teach them, them that, that the point of a rock, in other words, Jesus being the rock who is a sharp rock. But he says, behold, I want to reveal to you as you come into my curtain, into my court, into my courtyard. Why 30? Because if you would remember when we read the scriptures earlier, the entrance curtain was 30 feet long. Okay, Lord, why 30? Why not 25? The other two were 22 and a half on both sides. 22 and 22 and a half, 22 and a half equals what? 45. 45. And then 30 in the middle because remember it was 75 feet long. But he wanted the entrance into the courtyard. That curtain had to be 30 feet. 30, slow shim. The Hebrew letters for that. Shim. I think y'all are going to probably start learning a lot of these real quick. Shim is to devour, consume. His name's in it. El Shaddai. Lamed. Teach, learn, alert, urge forward, just like the number three. Shin, something sharp. Again, El Shaddai. Yo, Ham, finished work. Mem, water, mighty, massive. The entrance curtain was 30 feet long, made with fine linen, decorated with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and it would be attached to four posts. Not three but four. Do any of y'all remember when we studied about the curtain that went into the tabernacle what the different colors meant? Anybody remember? What did blue represent? Yes. What did purple represent? What did scarlet represent? The blood. You can see that when God commanded that they make the entrance, the curtain entrance, or entrance cur uh, curtain, with these specific colors, is all pointing to Jesus, even with the four posts versus the three on the, on the sides of it. Okay? So then I said, Lord, why four? Why four, Lord? Four, the Hebrew word for four is Arba. Arba. The Hebrew letters is Aleph, means strength, also means Adonai. Is that not another name for God? Yes, yes it is. Resh, highest, most important. Bet, house, tent, where you live. Ein, once again. To see, to experience, in this case, a fountain. You'll notice, remember on uh, here, there was mention of water, mighty massive. Here, in the four pillars, experience a fountain. <clears throat> Jesus is also called the living water. The living water. He's the rock. He's the living water. So, looking at the number four, it was amazed how many times, and this isn't even all of them, but how many times God was specific about the number four and the quantity of four. So, four. The number four represents God's creative works, especially works associated with the earth. Now, I have some uh, examples of where the four, number four was used in the Bible. For example, in Revelations 4, 6, and 8, there were four heavenly creatures surrounding God's heavenly throne. The Israelite camp was divided into four parts when camping around the tabernacle. The Jewish ancients considered there to be four elements here on earth. Earth, fire, air, and water. 
Four Gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We all know there are four seasons. Four directions. North, south, east, and west. With four <coughs> angels keeping watch at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the world in Revelation 7-1. There were four rivers that flowed out of Eden. Four letters formed God's divine name, which is what? Yahweh. When God, when they spelled his name Yahweh, it was just the, what we'll call like four consonants. It was the four letters that formed God's name, Yahweh. Four cherubims. And you'll find that in Ezekiel 3, I mean, excuse me, Genesis 3 and Ezekiel 1.10. In Ezekiel's vision of the heavenly throne or chariot, the cherubim each had four faces and bodies with four wheels. Also, four women gave birth to the fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. In other words, when Jacob had his sons, there were four women that were the four mothers within the twelve sons of Abraham, of uh, Jacob. The tallit, the outer cloak covenant men wear, required to wear, had four corners with four tassels. When you see a Jewish man and he's wearing his tallit, his prayer shawl, it's going to have the four corners with the four uh, tassels. And trust me, with God's uh, instructions with the tallit and the prayer shawl, there has to be a reason why he wanted four. Now, this is what I wanted to show you. Going back to the entrance into the tavern, as you can see, there were, remember, three pillars on each side. One, two, three. One, two, three. But the entrance into the tower, into the courtyard, had one, two, three, four, had the four pillars. That's why God had it, I mean, he, he had it specifically made that way. There are four posts to hold the curtain of the entrance that was 30 feet long. There are four gospels in the New Testament that testify of Jesus Christ himself because he is the way, he's the truth, and the life. So he, even in the tabernacle with the curtain that, was, that God was specific for them to make was pointing to his son. Because the four pillars are symbolic of the four gospels to where you and I learn about Jesus, his son. And it's not a coincidence that Jesus says, I am the way. All the way back. When God commanded how they should make his tabernacle, he wanted it to reflect his son. <laughs> and they didn't even know it back then. Because it was a foreshadow of his son who one day, when he came to earth, and then he gave his life as a sacrifice on the cross, he was known already as the way. And the only way, when you stop and think about it, that when Jesus died on the cross, we all know what the veil was ripped from top to bottom. He would have been the only one that could have done that because it was his tabernacle. It was his tabernacle. It was like the spirit of the living God was let out of the veil and released to mankind. To have access to him. But he went through every article of the tabernacle. And then when it was time for the cross, 
his shed blood was placed on what? Which article was his shed blood placed on? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. And because his blood was placed on the mercy seat, that gave us access. And God's like, no more, no more is there a boundary between mankind and his son. But back then, as they camped four different ways on the north, on the south, east, and west, all they could see was a veil, seven and a half feet tall. And only a select few were allowed to go in. And especially into the actual holy place and most holy place. Foreshadow Jesus. Just in a curtain, there was a foreshadow of his son. You know what it made me when I was studying this, what it made me feel was so blessed and privileged that because of the cross, you and I today aren't having to kind of peek over the fence. I wonder what's going on in there. Oh, I wish I could be in there. Oh, man, I can see God's glory cloud. But I'm not allowed to go in there. But now we can. Yeah. We get to see what's on the other side of the curtain. That's a blessing. That's a privilege. That we are not on the outside. And there's still so many people that are lost. And they're on the outside. And they have no idea what you are experiencing in his presence. Because he tabernacles <laughs> with each and every one of us. They have no idea what we experience. Can you imagine? We have the privilege right now to study the revelation of his word. Oh. Mm. God loved the children of Israel. They were his. And yet they didn't get to see what we saw. The fulfillment of the promise. We walk now in the fulfillment of that redemption plan. Man. So, if you remember, what held the curtains together when they were attached to the pillars was silver hooks. Silver hooks. Okay, Lord. The base was made of bronze, the pillar was bronze, the curtains were linen. Why silver hooks? Why not just make it all bronze? Silver, Hebrew word, cassette. <coughs> There's the Hebrew letters. Kof, cassette, kof means open hand to allow. Samech, prop, support, assist. Fade, also had that, that can be a dual. You can use it as the, as the letter P. You can use it as the letter F. It's a dual letter. Means entrance, beginning. So all the posts around the courtyard must be connected by silver rods using silver hooks. Yet the posts would be in bronze. So basically when you think about the silver hooks holding the linen curtains together, tightly together, with the pillar being bronze, but the hooks were silver. What was God basically saying when he said, I want the hooks to be silver? That he is there with that, with the silver. I'm there to support and assist entrance, beginning, open hand to allow in other words, there's going to come a day when the entrance, mankind's going to be able to go through those curtains 
and I'm going to be there. This is God. I'm paraphrasing here. God's going to be there to support you, to assist you, to allow you entrance in your begin walk with Him. The bases had to be a bronze. Weren't silver, weren't gold, even though the inside the tabernacle, the bases were um, different kind of, of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not materials, but uh, what's the word? Precious metals. Thank you, Chris. Yes, precious metals. All right. Bronze, brass. Remember, the base, the pillars were made of bronze, brass. What's the Hebrew word? Nakash. Hebrew letters, noon, means descendant, life, heir to the throne. Head, inner room, chamber, shin, consume, destroy. El Shaddai, bronze bases to support the courtyard. So why did God say all of these pillars that were going to hold up the curtains, <coughs> that were going to go around his tabernacle, he said, the base, the foundation is himself in it. Descendants, life, heir to the throne. Who is now heirs? We are joint heirs with who? Jesus. Jesus became our base. And he is our base into the tabernacle. We get to be partakers of the chambers in the inner room. God is mighty and powerful, but he can also consume and destroy. That's how powerful he is. And you know what I want him to consume and destroy? The sin in my life. Right. The impurities in my life. Because he's my foundation. And if he's my foundation, I have to be willing to let him get rid of what doesn't belong that, should, that I should allow to hold me up. And that should be him. Because I'm joint heirs with Jesus. I'm a descendant. You're a descendant. All right. The oil for the lamp. I love this picture. I thought, wow, what a... Because you know what? When I saw that, the first thing that hit me was the lamp stands in each and every one of us. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And that light, if, if people in their natural eyes could see it, I can't even imagine what would go through their mind. But you know what? You know who can see it? Is the enemy because he's in the spirit realm. And he can see if your lamp is glowing or not. He can see if it's flickering or not. And when he sees your light, the light of Jesus in you glowing so strong in the spirit of God in you, in your tabernacle, the light of the world being Jesus, I think he's going to back up a little bit when he sees it burning like that. But when I walked away from the Lord, I allowed it to snuff out. And I got attacked fiercely. Fiercely. But when I came back to him strong, that light of the Lord, of the Spirit of God lit up. Lit up. And that's why when you and I come against the adversary, he knows whether you mean what you say and you say what you mean. He does. He'll know, he knows if it, that fire in you is looking like that or is it flickering off and on, meaning we're kind of complacent. And yeah, sometimes I can be spiritual and sometimes I want to be in the world. And so it's like that light flickers. And he waits for the light to go out for a little while. And then he comes right on in. 
We've got to keep it right. Because the enemy's going to back up and think, you know what, I'm not just going to come after her. I'm coming after her. I'm going to try to and come up against the Spirit of God. Uh, no. And he's going to walk away. Now sometimes, yeah, okay, he does push our buttons. But when he sees that, he's going to think twice. And you are, Exodus 27, 20, and you are commanding Israelites to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to keep the lamps burning continually. God's already telling Moses, you have to command the Israelites to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to keep the lamps burning continually. If he commanded that back in the Old Testament in the tabernacle in the wilderness for the children of Israel, do you not think he's going to command that for us too? Verse 21, in the tent of meeting, which is also known as the tabernacle, <coughs> outside the veil, which is before the ark of the testimony, Aaron and his son shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generation for the sons of Israel. He's telling them that it must be a perpetual statute throughout their generations. Are we doing that with our generations? Are we keeping it bright morning or from evening to morning? He wanted it lit continually. Not only for them, but for the generations. Our tabernacle and the light within our tabernacle, the Spirit of God, should be continual to where our generations, our children, our children's children can see that light and be drawn to the light and want it for themselves. But there was many years where my light was out when I turned away and walked away from the Lord. And my children did not get to see it. And I regret those years. Yeah. But they see it now. Amen. Uh, now, oil for the lamp that God told them they had to continually keep that lamp stand lit all the time, continually. Well, they had to have oil for it. So what did they use? They used olive oil. So where is a good place to get olive oil? In Gethsemane. Because that's where they had olive trees. You see, there's two kinds, though, of, of a procedure that they do with olives. They are either going to be crushed or they're going to be pressed. And they're for two different reasons. Pressed, hard, pressed, or crushed. Literally obliterated, almost obliterated, crushed. There's two types of um, circumstance, I'll just use that word for lack of a better word, that they did regarding the olives. So, I went to the Hebrew word, actually, Gethsemane, literally, you would say Geth Sheminim. Shem and them. Get shim in them means press oil, oil press. And that's where you get Gethsemane. And who was pressed at the garden of Gethsemane? Jesus. Pressed. Drops of blood, it said. He, it's like he was 
He was sweating drops of blood. Why? Because even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was pressed. So, Hebrew letters for Gethsemane. Gimel means something lifted up. Tav, cross, covenant. Join two things together. Shin, devour, consume, sharp. Also remember El Shaddai in there too. Mem, mighty, massive. Nun, descendant, offspring, heir to the throne. Yo, deed done, finished work. Mem, to come from, like a water down the stream. So I want you to see, can you see Jesus in those explanations of the Hebrew word when you think about him being in the garden of Gethsemane? He was making a covenant, did he not? Because he told his father, Look, if it's possible that this cup can pass from me. But you know where the covenant was? When he said, nevertheless, not my will but yours. He made a covenant right then and there yeah. with his father. The covenant that he would follow through with the plan of redemption no matter the cost. Devour, consume. He was being consumed by what was in the cup. Because it was. It was mighty and massive. And being heir to the throne. Descendants. It was for the sake of all of us offspring and descendants. For him to be faithful to that covenant that they made of the redemption plan before the world began. And he needed to complete the finished work. But he had to become like water down the stream. That his blood would have to be poured out like water down the stream. And he had to commit to that. And make a covenant with that. Hmm. I don't think we will ever, ever fully understand what all he went through. Mm -hmm. you know? Ever. And that's why I love him so. And that's why I regret the years I turned my back on him. After all that I'm seeing, what he's done. But he's forgiven me for that. But I'll say it again. That's why I don't care. I'll drop to my knees. I don't care what anybody says. I'll, I'll, I'm all over the place a lot of times in worship. Why? Because I love him so. And I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for his long suffering that he waited for me to come back to him. I can't be still in a sanctuary. I can't because I'm reminded of his goodness and his mercy and his grace and forgiveness on my life. So they brought the pure oil of pressed olives for the light. The oil for the lamps on the lampstand, the only light in the tabernacle, came from pressed olives, not beaten, pressed. Beaten olive oil refers to the method of production of the very best oil. And when did that happen? He was pressed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But when he went to be crucified, he was beaten. Both methods were put on him. Pressed and beaten. You know why? Beaten is the very best you can do with olive to make it oil. God uses a pressing work in the life of his people. That's you and I. We, like Paul, may be hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, according to 2 Corinthians 4 8. 
And God uses our times of pressing for His glory. The scripture says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Amen. You see, we get pressed, but we don't get crushed because Jesus did that for us. I apologize. We a few minutes over. Um, we're just about. Aaron and his son shall tend to it from evening till morning. The priests were to tend the lamps, making sure that the lamps had oil to burn and that their wicks were trimmed so that the lamps would never go out, and especially during the night. God never wanted the lamps to lose their fire. Only by a continual supply of oil and trimmings of the wicks could keep them burning. We can only continue to be on fire for God if we are continually supplied with the oil of the Holy Spirit and are trimmed by God to bear even more light. Amen. Rabbi, did you see anything on Gethsemane? Law. You cover it all. Okay. Uh, we don't have time because I was going to go into the ten virgins with the oil and Ooh, there's some revelation there. But for time's sake, we're going to go to the quote. Are we going to do that next time? Next week. Yay. Yes. <laughs> we sure are. Yes. I just thought it was interesting that when they press all of the wool, especially back then, the third press is what they used for the oil lamps. And that's also... How many times Jesus prayed and gets in? Oh. So that's when he sweated blood. Three cool. uh, How many of you love Jesus? Yes! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. He's yeah. awesome! He was crushed yeah. for us. And all we get now sometimes is we get pressed. <laughs> but that's because it's for his glory. We end with a quote. Anointed faith is when your faith has been in contact with the presence of God. Amen. 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 Zach, would you mind closing some prayer? Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all the revelation that you brought to us today. God, we just ask that it would sink deep into our hearts. God, we thank you for keeping us safe as we leave this place, Lord. We lift up every prayer request, Father. We just bless those people. We pray for healing and uh, anything that's needed, Father, you know the needs. And we praise you for all that you do, Lord. We thank you for the blood of your Son and his resurrection. Yes. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In yes. Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless y'all. Have a good night. We'll see you soon.